This is Cashflow Ninja, Episode 9, with best-selling author Bob Berg. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here. Welcome to another episode of Cashflow Ninja. If you missed last week's episode featuring Kevin Clayson, America's Chief Officer of Awesome, you can go to cashflowninja.com forward slash 007 and listen to the episode again where Kevin talks about activating gratitude by flipping the gratitude switch, achieving financial freedom through generating income streams from single family homes, and why network marketing can be a great opportunity for the right person, and more. Today's show is a very special episode for me. About five years ago, I went through a very challenging period of my life, and I faced plenty of adversity. I had failed in many areas of my life and had many setbacks, and (laughs) they happened all at the same time. You know what they say, when it rains, it pours. Initially, I pointed the finger at everyone else and blamed everyone else for my shortcomings. And for some reason, I'm actually quite embarrassed to admit this, but I had a sense of entitlement, which if I look back now, I really don't understand why I did at the time, but I'll admit it, I I, I did. And uh, I think when I started to take responsibility for my own actions in my life and the position that I found myself in, and I realized that the problem was not everything around me, but was actually me, I started to turn my life in the right direction again. Then um, after some soul searching, I started to read again, which I really enjoy. One of my favorite hobbies is reading. And I came across this book that would really shift my paradigm and change my thinking and overall outlook in life. I had one aha moment after another, and I realized some really painful things that I had to admit to myself at that time just to help me grow in general as a person. The principles and values taught in that book was something that I strive to live by every day at the time. Um, At that stage, I was just taking it a day at a time. And I still do to this very day. I still have those principles pinned up um, in my office. That book was called The Go-Giver, a little story about a powerful business idea by Bob Burke and John David Mann. I'm extremely honored to be interviewing the author of this book five years later on my podcast. My guest today is Bob Berg. Bob is a sought-after speaker at company leadership and sales conferences on topics at the core of the Go-Giver books. A former television personality and top-producing salesperson, Bob has shared the platform with some of today's top business leaders, broadcast personalities, coaches, athletes, and political leaders, including a former U.S. president. He was named by the American Management Association as one of the top 30 most influential thought leaders in business for 2014. In addition to co-authoring the best-selling Go-Giver books with John David Mann, Bob has authored a number of popular books, including the critically acclaimed Endless Referrals, Network Your Everyday Contacts into Sales and Adversaries into Allies. His total book sales are well over a million copies. His book, The Go-Giver, co-authored with John David Mann, has sold over half a million copies and has been translated into 21 languages. It has been released in a new expanded edition with a foreword by Huffington Post founder and publisher Ariana Huffington. Bob is an advocate, supporter, and defender of the free enterprise system, believing that the amount of money one makes is directly proportional to how many people they serve. He is also an unapologetic animal fanatic, and serves on the board of trustees of Furry Friends Adoption and Clinic in his hometown of Jupiter, Florida. Before we jump into our interview with Bob Burke, I just wanted to thank our sponsors. Audible, you can download any book for free when you try Audible for 30 days. Grab your free trial and audio book download at cashflowninja.com forward slash free book download and thrive15.com. 
Thrive15.com provides 15-minute lessons in every aspect of business from marketing and branding to bookkeeping from world-class mentors. Get a free month of access and learn new skills in just 15 minutes a day at thrive15.com forward slash cash flow. You can find all of our show notes and past shows at cashflowninja.com and also join our community and mailing list by texting the word cashflow ninja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. Community members on our mailing list get the weekly show sent directly to their inbox along with other valuable resources and information. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Cashflow Ninja Podcast with your host, MC Lobsher. You must be prepared to ignite. Bob, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Honored to be with you. Can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey and what inspired you to co-author the book, The Go-Giver, a little story about a powerful business idea with John David Mann? Sure. Well, I actually began in broadcasting, first as a sportscaster on radio and then as a television newscaster. Uh, worked my way up to late night news anchor of a uh, s- very small ABC affiliate in the uh, Midwestern U.S., uh, I was not very good at it. I could read the news, but that was about it. I certainly wasn't a journalist, and it wasn't long before I found myself no longer in broadcasting, but I, what I like to say, graduated into sales. The the biggest challenge I had in sales was I had no experience in, in professional selling, so I floundered for a while until I began to come across great authors such as Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins, and I would study and read their books and listen to their their tapes. That's how long ago this was. This was 35 years ago, their tapes, not even CDs. Um, but what was interesting was that in a very relatively short period of time, my sales really began to take off and I was doing well. And the, the big difference was that now I had uh, information. <laughs> I had a system for, for doing so. And you know, to this day, I personally define a system as simply the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles. In other words, if it's been proven, and predictability, by the way, is the key. If it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired results of B, then you know that all you need to do is A and continue to do A, and eventually you'll get the desired results of B. So uh, I learned that not only did I not have to reinvent the wheel, there was no need for it. And you know, from there, I, I sort of grew as a salesperson, and uh, worked my way up to sales manager of a company and began speaking to others about that. And it sort of morphed into a speaking business. And I've been doing that now for 20, well, close to probably 30 years now. Well, the book has had a tremendous impact on my life and shifted my paradigm during a time in my life when I faced great adversity and challenges. Mm. And I definitely strive to live the values that you, and laws that you presented in the book day, daily. For listeners that are not familiar with the book, can you discuss the premise of the book? Sure. And it's a, it's a business parable. So it's a short story, actually, about a guy named Joe who's a, an up-and-coming, young, ambitious, aggressive salesperson. Not, you know, nice, nice guy and good intent, but he's very focused on himself. And it's kind of all about him. And he's nowhere near as successful as he believes he, he should be. And he really can't understand why. And then he meets a, a, you know, a mentor and a series of people that share the five laws that you discuss. Now, the, the actual premise of the story, as you asked, is that, and it's a simple one, really, and that is that shifting one's focus, and this is really the key, shifting one's focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, We simply mean constantly and consistently providing value to others, providing value to the marketplace. And that doing so is not only a a, a nice way to live life, a pleasant way to live life, uh, but a very financially profitable way as well. Can you give us a quick summary of the five laws? Sure. The laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and uh, receptivity. Uh, now, to uh, as a, an overview of the laws, the law of value says your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Now, this sounds counterintuitive, counterproductive when you first hear it, right? Because it sounds like you're not making a profit. You have more in value right. than you take in payment. Of course, you'd go out of business if that was the case. So we have to understand the difference between price and value. 
Uh, price is a dollar figure. It's a, a dollar amount. It's finite. It is what it is. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea that brings so much worth or value to it that someone will willingly exchange their money for it and be glad they did while you make a very healthy profit? And so what it comes down to is the entire buying experience, not just the intrinsic value of the product or service, but the entire experience, the entire way you make this person feel about the experience is really what we're talking about. So that they come out feeling as though they received a lot more in value than what they paid, which they did, and you made a very, very healthy profit. Uh, But it all starts with the focus, the focus not being on getting that person's money from their you know, wallet to yours. No, it's the focus on giving value to them. And this is why we say that money is simply an echo of value. It's the right. thunder, if you will, to value lightning, which means the value comes first and the money you receive is simply a very natural and direct result of the value you've provided. Uh, that's law, law number one. Uh, I'll try to make the others a lot quicker. <laughs> no, no, that's very, very insightful. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, now, law number two is the law of compensation. And the law of compensation says your your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives you touch with that exceptional value – the more money with which you'll be rewarded. Uh, in the story, the um, the CEO, uh, Nicole Martin, explained to Joe, the protege, that law number one, the law of value, while that represents your potential income, uh, that's all it is. It's not a matter, though, of just providing great value to one person. To earn a high income, you must you must impact the lives of many people with that value. So we can say that exceptional value Law number one, plus significant reach, law number two, equals very high compensation. Law number three is the law of influence. And the law of influence says that your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, again, this sounds counterproductive at best and perhaps downright uh, Pollyanna-ish at worst. And yet, you think about it, the greatest leaders, the top influencers, the highest money earning salespeople. This is simply how they run their lives and conduct their businesses. They're always looking for, they're always thinking of the other person. Uh, how can I help them? What's the value I can provide to them? And, it, you know, but, it, it, well, but I got to tell you what's important. I want to qualify this if I can, because it's very easy to misunderstand this. When we say place the other person's interest first, we certainly don't mean you should ever be anyone's doormat or a martyr, or self-sacrificial in any way. Absolutely not at all. It's simply that as several of the mentors told Joe, the protege, the golden rule of business, of sales, of influence, of network, and what have you, of life, (laughs) is simply that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those kinds of feelings toward you in others than by genuinely moving from what we call an I focus or me focus to an other focus. Always looking for ways to, as Sam, one of the mentors told Joe, actually make your win about the other person's win. And when you do that and you do that consistently and you become known for doing that, All of a sudden, you're the go-to person. You're that center of influence. You're the one that others know, love, and trust, whose lives they want to be a part of, who are really your personal walking ambassadors. Law number four is the law of authenticity. And this one says that the the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. Uh, One of the mentors in the story, uh, Deborah Davenport, she shared a lesson she learned in her sales career that That basically is that, you know, all the the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, 
as important as they are, and you know they, they are, they're all very, very important, they're also all for naught if you don't show up as your true self. On the other hand, when you do, when you, as we like to say, uh, show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, consistently, people feel very comfortable with you. They feel good about you. Again, they know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to be in relationship with you. I think the key to showing up authentically is understanding your strengths and understanding the the value that you do legitimately bring to the table. Uh, that's one reason why it's so important to have a coach such as you who can uh, who can helpfully yet dispassionately be able to objectively look at someone and help them discover what their strengths really are. Because sometimes as human beings, we're so close to ourselves emotionally, it's difficult for us to see what we have that's really special. And uh, and the last law, law number five, is the law of receptivity. And this one says that the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. Uh, near the end of the story, the, the main mentor, Pindar, asked Joe, the protege, to breathe out and hold that outgoing breath to the count of 30. Uh, it's harder than it sounds. I do that with my audiences quite a bit, and everyone's amazed at how difficult it really is. And uh, nice. about 10, 11 seconds, you know, Joe is struggling for air. He's gasping for breath. And Pinder says, what's the matter, Joe? Can't do it. And Joe says, no, I can't just breathe out. I've got to breathe in. And Pindar jokingly says, well, Joe, what if I was to tell you that it's been medically proven that it's actually healthier to breathe out than it is to breathe in? And you know, Joe just laughed. Of course, he said, that's, that's silly. It's impossible. You, you, you can't do one or the other. You've got to do both. Well, of course we do, right? We breathe out and we breathe in. It's not an either or. We breathe out carbon dioxide and we breathe in oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving. We also breathe in, which is receiving. You know, the world gives us a lot of, not even mixed, but a lot of negative messages about money and about wealth and about prosperity. If you read the papers, well, I don't know who reads the papers anymore, but if you go online or listen to it, right? If you right. listen to the, the, to the, to people, you'll get this feeling that, gosh, to make a lot of money, you had to do something wrong, right? You had to do something right. bad, you're on the backs of people, rah, rah, rah. And, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of people in the world, certainly, and we, we have to be aware there are those that do wrong things, but in a, especially the more free market, uh, economy that it is, where in, in a free market, no one is forced to do business with one another. Okay, so they, right. they only do it because they both think they're going to pro uh, prosper by that, which is the, the best reason for doing business. In a free market-based economy, you absolutely positively cannot prosper unless you provide exceptional value to the lives of lots of people. Because remember, uh, you know, nobody is going to buy from you because you need the money. They're not going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. They're not even going to buy from you because you're a nice person who has a product that you think they should have. Uh, they're going to buy from you only because they believe it's in their best interest to do so. And that's the only reason why they should. So, uh, again, assuming no, that no cronyism or other kind of government interference has, has taken place, the only way one can, can be profitable is by providing exceptional value to other people. So, and I, and I know that's how everyone who's listening does it. And so the, the, the point is this. Giving and receiving, despite what you might hear, are not opposite concepts. They're not opposites. They're simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work together in tandem. The question is not, are you a giver or a receiver? It's, you are a giver and a receiver. The key is that you focus on the giving of value to everyone. You focus on the value, and then you've got to be able to allow yourself to receive, because all the giving in the world is fantastic, but it's all for naught if you're not willing and able to allow yourself to receive uh, according to the value you've provided. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one point that you made, too, and I'm so glad you explained that, is the difference between price and value. I was just recently on a trip to Galway in Ireland, which is the hometown of Oscar Wilde, and Oscar Wilde actually has this pretty funny quote where he said, Today, ev everybody knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Uh, so I thought that was very insightful. Thank so thank you for, for explaining that and sharing that. 
Now, Bob, was there one piece of advice you re- had received or an experience that you've had that have impacted you before you knew anything about what it was all about of being a go-giver? Yeah, you know, there was a there was something that happened. And this is, remember I, I, I said about 35 years ago, I probably started in sales, maybe a little bit right. more than that. But soon afterwards, as I was starting to do really well, I was working for a company and we were selling a product that was a, a rather high ticket item, a great product. And I was I was doing well, but not as well as I could have been. And and much of it had to do with the fact that my focus was while I, you know, of course, wanted to help the people I was I was serving. It was still to me about the product itself. It was about the sales process. And it was something that, uh, you know, a lot of young salespeople go through and, until you learn. And fortunately, there was a, a man at the company where I worked. He was not the sales manager. In fact, I think he was you know, one of the engineers or something, and he was just about to retire. I, I, I had seen him in the hallways a couple of times. Pleasant guy. Didn't know his name. Still don't. And I think he retired soon after this this very key conversation. <laughs> but he, he looked at me, I think, as someone with potential but who needed a needed some advice. And uh, he, he said to me, Berg, can I tell you something? I, I said, sure. You know, one, one thing about me, I was always willing to listen and, and take, you know, take advice. Didn't mean I was followed it. OK, but I was willing to listen and, and then, you know, kind of think it out. I'm very glad I listened to this person. He said, Berg, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, he continued, you'll get a reward. The reward will be in the form of money, and you can do with that money whatever you want. But never forget, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It's not the target itself. Your target is serving others. And to me, that was a huge, huge difference maker. Everything changed after that. That's very, very powerful. Now let's talk about mentorship for a, for a moment. You, you had mentioned men- mentorship and explaining the laws as well. For people that are trying to find a mentor, what is the best way to find a mentor that fits? And what would you advise an up and comer not to do when trying to find a mentor? Oh, those are those are both good questions because hey, you know, when you can find a mentor, you're going to cut your learning curve dramatically. It's someone who can who can share with you some of their wisdom and, and help you over the bumpy spots and uh, not do it for you, but be there as a, as a guide. I mean, it's a fantastic thing. So I recommend finding a mentor if you can. However, there are ways to go about it that are, that are correct and productive in ways that typically are, are counterproductive. And I, I see this a lot, actually. It's the person who will call or visit or email or, you know, whatever the medium happens to be, but they will reach out to someone who they admire in business and they will say something like, Hey, I'm you know, starting a, a business where I'm doing this and this. Will you be my mentor? <laughs> and right. what happens with that is it's sort of like asking someone, Hey, you know, despite the fact that you, you don't know me from a hole in the wall, would you be willing to dedicate your time and energy and share with me the 40 or 50 years of experience you have in business? <laughs> you know, yeah. because see, a, a mentor protege relationship is just that it's a relationship and it takes time to develop and it, it really cannot be rushed. And, and so the, the best way to do it is by all means, you can approach that, that person. Again, the, the medium in which you approach them doesn't even matter these days, but uh, you can approach them by, you know, letting them know you, you know, the, that uh, you are beginning a business. You admire what they've done. You've studied, uh, you know, their work. And if it's not too presumptuous of me to ask, may, you know, may I ask you a couple of very specific questions? Uh, of course, I realize you're busy. And if this is something that just is not you're not able to do, I understand completely. So you're doing it in a very respectful way. You're letting this person know it's not like you have any uh, entitlement to it or, or to their wisdom, right. but that you're asking in a polite way that, you know, it's hopeful. And yet you're giving them the out, the back door, so they don't feel, and the chances are they're probably going to say, you know, sure, I, absolutely, I've got a few minutes or I can answer a couple of questions because you've done it the right way. Now, one thing I would suggest is do your research. Make sure you don't ask them a question that you could easily know the answer to if only you did your research. 
right? Because you know right. there's plenty you can find on them. So you, 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 the, the questions you ask should be very specific and very, you know, so it's not, it's not something that, that they are thinking, oh gosh, what is this guy or, or gal? What are they uh, doing? They're wasting my time. And so, uh, and so when you do that and they give you their advice, you know, uh, again, you know, thank them profusely and so forth and let them know that you're going to put that to, to action and that you'll keep in touch and let them know how things are going. I would also that day write a handwritten personalized note of thanks to them. Handwrite the envelope, put a regular stamp on it, and send it. I'm just letting them know again, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you sharing your wisdom. I look forward to putting it to use and letting you know the outcome. Boom, send it out to them. You can also, again, by researching them, find out their charitable cause. Maybe they uh, are on the board of directors of their local humane society. And so you you make a sm- just small, small donation in their name. That will that will be sent to, you know, they will get notified of that. You're not doing it to kiss up to them. You're doing it so that they can see you respect the process that you're saying, hey, I realize right now uh, I can't add the kind of value to you that you can add that you can add to me. But I want you to know how much I appreciate it. And I'm looking for ways to add value to you in a way that matters to you. Right. And right. You know, and so you do it this way. And. Uh, eventually you follow up with them again, let them know how you're doing, maybe ask another question. And, and over time, this mentor-protege relationship develops. Very good advice. Um, now, Bob, I, I love your philosophy about the free enterprise system and your passion for entrepreneurship. Everyone, however, does not have the entrepreneurial spirit. How does the message in the go-giver apply to them as well? Mm. Yeah, another great question. Because not everyone, by the way, should be an entrepreneur. My friend Carol Roth wrote a great book, The Entrepreneurial Equation, where part of the book, she goes into kind of asking questions so that you'll know, should I even be an entrepreneur? Just because I know how to do a thing doesn't mean I should be in business doing this thing. Right. So, right. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. You know, we think of the entrepreneur in the context of, you know, they invest money in a business or they seek investment. They have a product or service they believe in. They go out to the marketplace. They sell it. They expand. They hire more people. They, and all that's great. That is, that is entrepreneurship, of course. But entrepreneurship is also a certain type of way of approaching a thing. And you don't need to be in business for yourself to be entrepreneurial. If you're working as an engineer in a firm, a bookkeeper in a firm, if you are doing, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're a processor in a firm, whatever, you can still be entrepreneurial. In fact, instead of being an entrepreneur, you are an intrapreneur, right? You're an entrepreneur within another person's organization, and you right. still have customers, and you still must provide value to them. But this, in this case, though, who are your customers? Your customers are your coworkers. Your customer is your supervisor. Your customer is your employer, and you're always looking to do things in such a way that you're always giving more in value to the enterprise than what you receive in payment. But again, you're still making a good you're still making a good salary and what happens is when you when you think how much value can I give for what I'm receiving rather than how little value can I give for what I'm receiving, now you're you're creating you're making yourself even more valuable. And that's how you make get paid more money because remember, it's in their best interest to keep you with them. It's how you get promoted. It's how you grow. Right. And that's another a mindset change right there. Instead of waiting or feeling entitled, oh, I need a raise or I need to make more money, provide as much value uh, as you possibly can yes. within your organization because working in a big corporation or even smaller, smaller businesses, I mean, you're your customer, you're, you're dealing with people inside your organization, mm-hmm. outside. So on both side, sides of the ball, to use that analogy, uh-huh. just provide as much value as humanly possible. Right? Yes, I love it. Absolutely. Now, one habit I've observed from very wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skills. What are you currently studying and what new skill sets are you currently learning? Well, I, you know, I love to learn. I just did a video today that about Simon Sinek's great book, uh, Leaders Eat Last, uh, which I was rereading again. And, uh, or I should say rereading, I guess rereading would mean you're doing it again. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, you, and I was just learning so much again, even more the second time than the first time. And I'm, I'm constantly learning about leadership. 
gosh, I'm just trying to think. I'm constantly studying, uh, you know, whether it's philosophy or politics or economics or whatever, just because w- I think we need to keep learning. We need to keep our mind sharp. Spoke in uh, China a couple of years ago, so I began learning Mandarin beforehand. And okay. I, I didn't speak it fluently, but I was able to do the first paragraph of my, you know, the opening paragraph of my talk in Beijing in Mandarin, you know, oh, that's and, fantastic. But, you know, yeah. But you know what's so great about it? It was just opening my mind to a different way. And and that's right. the key part. Uh, so, you know, I, I just I, I agree with what you're saying. It's just always great to learn, to study, to expand our minds. What other books would you recommend to my audience? Well, one book which very few people know about, it's called The Secret of Selling Anything uh, by Harry Brown, B-R-O-W-N-E. Now, you know, the the, the um, title itself isn't to me an appealing title because it implies, you know, not the re- – but no, the, first of all, this book was written – was published after Harry passed away. He was an author uh, – on uh, economics and politics, many, uh, many times New York Times bestselling author on uh, economics. But Harry really understood human nature. He was a very kind man. He was a very gracious man. And these uh, he, he wrote these two short manuscripts back in the 60s, and he never published them. And after he passed away, uh, his wife, Mrs. Brown, found them on the uh, hard drive, and she found a uh, independent publisher who published them, who, who titled it The Secret of Selling Anything. But this book is absolutely one of the most brilliant, brilliant books I've ever read in my life. The first part of it is really all about understanding human nature. It's understanding and respecting human nature. It's working within human nature and understanding why people do the things they do. And to me, that book alone, whether you ever got into sales or not, that that part of the book is worth everything. Okay. The second part of the book is how to apply that to the selling process. And, you know, with Harry, as he says, the secret of selling anything is very easy. It shouldn't be a secret. It's simply find out what people want and help them get it. That, that's right. what it is. You know, I always personally define selling as simply discovering what the other person needs, wants, or desires and helping them to get it. So I did a blog post on Harry uh, on Harry's book at my Berg, uh, B-U-R-G dot com uh, slash blog site. If you go in and in the search engine and put the secret of selling anything need not be a secret or put in Harry Brown, uh, you can find it. But this is a book that I would suggest for everyone to to own and you'll probably end up reading it again and again and again. Thank you for recommending that. And I'll put a link to uh, your blog post in today's show notes as well. Do you have any favorite resources that you use on a daily basis that you would recommend? My business partner, Kathy Tejanel, who really runs the operations of the business. I mean, she uses uh, Infusionsoft, contact management uh, system. So she's a big believer in that. Of course, I, I'm online a lot and you know, use Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn and so forth. And so those are, you know, those are tools that I use. But again, those are just simply tools to help in the connection process. It's really all about anything that you utilize. It, it's always the question always has to be asked first. How does doing what I'm about to do, how might this add value to another person's life? Now, there's one question that I, that I ask on the show is if you cannot pass on any money to your children or grandchildren and you are only allowed to pass on five principles and values to help them build wealth and achieve success and happiness in life, what would they be? Are there any other values and principles besides the five laws of stratospheric success that you could recommend? Well, I'd have to say that, you know, the purpose of any individual life is to be happy. Okay. Now, this doesn't mean selfish. It doesn't mean at anyone's expense. Of, of course, if, if, if you were to do something at someone else's expense, you shouldn't be happy. So, no. But happiness is, is the key. Happiness is what we – anything we do in life, and Harry talks about this, is always in the seeking of happiness. Now, I define happiness as an ongoing feeling of joy and peace of mind, the result of living congruently with your values, okay? So this to me is right. key. 
You should have a set of values by which you live your life. I can't tell anyone what those values should be. I could pass them on to my kids if I, you know, and so forth. And I'd, obviously there's things like kindness, honesty, a sense of humor, uh, the desire to add value to the lives of others, uh, making people feel genuinely good about themselves. These are all, to me, values that if we act congruently with those values, we will be happy. We will uh, have that ongo- that feeling of ongoing joy and peace of mind. Uh, so I don't know if that really answers the question, and there weren't five things, I guess. I apologize, but... That would be the main thing, to seek happiness by living congruently with your values and obviously have values that add to the world. How can my audience learn more about you, your books, your events, speaking engagements, your fantastic podcast, which I'm a fan of, and other projects that you're involved in? Probably the best thing to do is to go to uh, thegogiver.com, and that's without the hyphen in this case. It's just thegogiver.com. They scroll down, they'll see the podcast, they can subscribe to if they like, they can see the books, The Go-Giver, and our newest book, The Go-Giver Leader. And if they click on the individual books, they can get a a chapter or an excerpt so they can see if they like it first. They can connect with me online, they can check out our certified Go-Giver speaker program, our upcoming Go-Giver sales academy, and all the the different goodies we have and all the different resources. But I I got to tell you, it's just been such a, a pleasure and an honor to, to be on your show. You're fantastic, and you, it's just a great conversation. Bob, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and philosophy and the five laws of stratospheric success. Thank you for providing so much valuable content and knowledge on today's show. I know the information that you've shared will be life-changing for our listeners. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me and my guest, Bob Berg, today. Bob shared some amazing information, and I know there's some of you listening that would have had a paradigm shift and change in your thinking today. As I mentioned before, I certainly did the first time I read it, and it had a profound impact on the way that I started to see the world. If you want to take immediate action, you can go to www.thegogiver.com and immediately download Chapter 1 from Bob's international bestseller, The Go-Giver, and access lots of value-added resources, such as his special report, The Go-Giver Way, Five Principles for Creating a Culture of Excellence. Please also support our show sponsors, Audible. Download any audiobook for free when you try Audible for 30 days. Grab your free trial and audiobook download at cashflowninja.com forward slash free book download. If you haven't read The Go-Giver, you can use your free download to listen to the audiobook version. Our other sponsor, Thrive15.com, provides 15-minute lessons in every aspect of business, from marketing and branding to bookkeeping from world-class mentors. Get a free month of access and learn new skills in just 15 minutes a day at thrive15.com forward slash cash flow. You can find all of our show notes and past shows at cashflowninja.com and join our mailing list by texting the word Cashflow Ninja, one word capitalized to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. Community members on our mailing list get the weekly show sent directly to their inbox along with other valuable resources and information. That's our show for today, everyone. I hope you found it extremely valuable. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cash Flow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals. And you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.